Let me now introduce uh, Dr. Lance Liotta, uh, whose reputation is well established. Uh, since uh, 2005, Dr. Liotta has served as a co-director and co-founder of the Center for Applied Proteomics and Molecular Medicine at George Mason University. Uh, Dr. Liotta has invented and patented, along of course with his laboratory co-inventors, transformative technologies in the field of uh, diagnostics, cancer molecular therapeutics, in particular the microdissection or laser capture microdissection. Uh, Dr. Liotta has more than uh, 100 issued or always patents and around uh, 700 publications. So thank you, Dr. Liotta, for accepting our invitation to present your work today and to moderate this webinar. Enjoy. Yes, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm very grateful. Yes. So uh, welcome to our workshop on sampling methods. And I want to really uh, give a um, note of gratitude, a great gratitude to Claudia for conceiving of this very timely topic. This is a rapidly expanding field of new technologies that are devoted to interrogation at the molecular level of cells in tissues. And we're going to hear from thought leaders in the field, first from Daniel Rosenberg, who is analyzing immune and inflammatory signaling at the uh, using high sensitivity targeted gene expression profiling to look at um, checkpoint and T cell exhaustion genes in um, pre-malignant polyps. Very important topic because we want to understand the genomic and the proteomic underpinnings of transition from pre-malignant to invasive cancer. Then we're going to hear from Amanda Cadegal, who's studying cerebral organoids, a really exciting field. And she's going to tell us uh, how she's created libraries to study individual cells in the developing human brain uh, as a model for the developing human brain using cerebral organoids. And then Joe Fo Foley, um, our third thought leader, is going to be talking about how to achieve very high yield of even degraded RNA to make libraries from paraffin or formal and fixed uh, laser capture microdissection tissues, combining it with Smart3Seq. So really exciting topics. And for my talk, I'm going to review some of the, the new technologies that have emerged for everybody to use in the microgenomics world. And I'll then focus on phosphoproteomics at the tissue level using laser capture microdissection. And have a little uh, thought about where the future is going for translating spatially resolved molecular profiling of cells into the clinic, into patient uh, tailored therapy. So spatial molecular profiling in the complex tissue microenvironment is a booming topic because we now realize you can't just grind up the tissue and analyze the genomics or proteomics of individual cells of interest. The ongoing functions of normal and disease cells in tissue are a product of the local cell, cell, cell extracellular matrix, fluctuating metabolic states of the, of the um, host, the immune cell interactions, systemic influences, and all sorts of ex external stresses like, like therapies. So, um, we need technologies to pluck out, sample, or analyze individual cells within these complex tissues, whether they're plant tissues, brain, normal tissues, pre-malignant, or the, the complex uh, tumor microenvironment. All of these uh, cells in all these tissues are a product at the moment to moment of the context they are in. And that cannot be really adequately modeled uh, unless you have either an organoid where you have all the cells around each other, um, but not a, a monolayer culture, we think. So we need to actually interrogate cells in their context. 
is particularly true, as I'll show you later, for cell signaling, which goes on within cells and between cells, between the, the immune cells and the, uh, and the, in this case, cancer. And you can see that here's phosphoprotein staining for specific phosphorylated activated proteins um, in, in a, a specific signaling pathway involved in uh, handling metabolic stress. And you can see that in these small pieces of the tumor, in this uh, tumor tissue array, that they're all different in every, in very, t each, each tumor sample. And both normal cells and the tumor cells, in this case, can make the same markers, but different levels or different amounts of phosphoprotein activation. So if you just grind up the tissue, you're going to get false positives coming from the host, and you'll get false negatives if you dilute out what's in the, it's in the tumor. So we need to look at individual cells. And so therefore, there's been an explosion of new technologies for tissue spatial molecular profiling. Scientists around the world have, you know, currently developing, publishing really exciting methods. And the, these, these can be looked upon in two major categories. One is categories where you already know what you're looking for in the tissue and you have a specific probe that is used to detect the molecule genomic proteomic of interest and you apply that to the tissue and you can apply that to the tissue on the surface of the tissue in the intact tissue and then read it out by a variety of methods such as scanning MALDI or um, um, or Cytoff, or you can use nanostring and other methods to specifically label the, the probe uh, of interest in your tissue. Or what we'll be talking a little bit more detail about is you can procure full thickness pieces of the tissue containing the cells of interest from the tissue section using laser capture microdissection. And for laser capture microdissection, you can look at the tissue that you procure with a probe for looking, if you know what you're looking about, uh, looking for ahead of time, or you can use it to uh, do mass spec or make libraries for discovery purposes. Let's uh, examine some of the exciting technologies that have been developed in each of these major categories. Here, here is an example uh, from Gary Nolan's lab of the technology called Codex, Codex, in which the antibodies are made against different antigens in the cellular tissue microenvironment, and they're labeled with a barcode that can be recognized and iter iteratively, iteratively analyzed by different fluorescent probes. Then you combine the image processing with n-dimensional imaging where you overlay all your um, the fluorescent probes, and you can look at um, a whole series of, of markers. And in this case, they're showing how coordinated cellular microenvironment um, immune cell populations have a role in colorectal cancer at the invasive front. Very, uh, very exciting. But that, that is a method where you're using staining methods on the tissue and then doing sophisticated probe analysis and reconstruction of the, of the color map of the cell uh, probe, probes. If you want to get a full thickness sample of the uh, more material per cell to look at for genomics, proteomics, glycomics, laser, laser uh, capture microdissection, developed... Uh, several years ago, but is still widely used. And it comes in different types of instruments. You can use IR infrared capture where you're grabbing onto the cells and pulling them out. You can use UV cutting where you're cutting out the area around the cell, and then you're uh, launching that forward or you're dropping it by gravity. Uh, or you can combine the two methods with infrared capture to grab the cells that you've already cut out with the UV. All of these methods are highly successful at procuring individual cells, groups of cells, and then those cells can be analyzed for mutation analysis, proteomics, um, 
at the mass spec level for discover, proteomics at the immunoassay level, such as the proteomic arrays that we use, gene expression, and uh, RNA sequencing. All these methods can be applied. In fact, if we look at the host of technologies out there for spatial molecular profiling, and this is just some of them shown in this, uh, this figure from the Museum of Spatial Transcriptomics, we see that LCM ha has had the most public publications, mainly, mainly because of its historical contributions, and there's a ton of other new technologies coming up. And um, none of these is considered really much better than the others. They're just different depending on their intended use. And LCM is now being combined with other methods. Overall, what matters is how you use these technologies to make discover discoveries in basic biological questions or key questions about disease pathogenesis. And here's an example. Uh, from Anna Cassant, Cassassant, who's uh, um, shown that laser capture microdissection could be used to analyze individual cells within pre-malignant breast cancer lesions, showing that the genomic hallmarks of cancer invasion and metastasis already pre-exist in the pre-malignant state, and they're just carried over into the invasive cells. It's it's not as if the invasive cells have switched from, uh, from the pre-invasive to a whole new category of expression in the invasive. And this has been proven over the years with other work with laser capture microdissection or work that we, we have done where you can even culture the cells in the human DCIS and show that they have genomic uh, alterations similar to the invasive cancer outside the dock and can be grown in nude mice. So I found this very exciting because it really nails the, the conclusion down that pre-malignant state is predetermined uh, right in the, in the early stage of the cancer development. Another example where LCM is coupled with mass spectrometry is for plant single cell analysis um, in which, uh, in this case, the whole system is automated and optically guided uh, for analysis of single plant and algae cells using laser microdissection and liquid vortex capture mass spectrometry. And another further example is in integra integrating LCM with genomics technologies. And here, Nichterwitz and, and, et al. has combined um, genomic technologies to make LCM seek libraries at very sensitive down to the single cell level. And here's the really outstanding yield that's being observed uh, by, the, by this group with this combination of LCM and genomics. So it's an example of how the technologies are, not, are much better when you combine them and use them for specific purposes. And here is maybe even an uh, exciting example of where the future is going beyond even just single cell to single pseudopod protrusion in tissue of invading cells that's being studied at the proteomic level by laser capture microdissection. And uh, I can see a future in which we're going to be looking at individual organel organelles within cells. So even beyond single cell analysis to ultrastructural analysis at the tissue level. And um, a last example before I talk about what we've been doing is the spatial transcriptomic analysis of cryosection tissue from day seven mouse embryos in which they were able to sequence 20 million reads and all the mapping ratios were greater than 80,000. So readably, they detected um, 8,000 to 10,000 unique genes for each LCM sample. So this shows how, you know, the rapid progression of the field now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're working on. We're focusing on the use of LCM for phosphoprotein biomarkers. And LCM is particularly good for this purpose because you get a full thickness sample of these individual cells or the groups of cells you are interested in studying. And you can study the phospho phosphorylation of multiple proteins involved in 
triggering signaling pathways. And as we see here, a phosphoprotein, phos the phosphorylation of specific sites on specific signaling proteins gives you the information about whether those signaling pathways are firing or not. Because the phosphorylation of the sites, in this case in the EGFR dimer, the phosphorylation then links the cytoplasmic tail of that receptor to downstream signaling. An example I'm going to talk about is HER2 therapy of breast cancer, for which there's a, uh, a variety of new treatments. They all work at this signaling uh, network at different levels, either outside the cell or inside the cell. And then this hopefully will block the downstream signaling by HER2 that drives the breast cancer. So how do you measure phosphoproteins and map them in the tissue in small numbers of cells, such as what you get from LCM? Because it's phospho antibodies to phosphoproteins are not as high affinity often, and it's very difficult to uh, stain for many phosphoproteins in an individual tissue sample. And so we use LCM to procure out the tissue cells of interest, and then we use reverse phase protein microarrays. It's simply a glorified microscopic uh, type of dot blotting where we can uh, then use uh, antibodies specifically for the phosphorylation site on the protein and look at many, many endpoints at once. This is highly sensitive and, and highly reproducible and has very good linear range. And we can look at all of these phosphorylated protein sites for many different signaling pathways in one tiny a quarter of a core needle biopsy by microdissection, looking at specifically the tumor cells or the host cells, the immune cells, or the stromal cells. And so we, for this example, we applied this to, to see if we could see a phosphoproteomic signature that was relevant to predictor of whether an individual therapy of those different types of HER2 therapies that I mentioned, whether an individual therapy would cause a patient's tumor treated with that therapy in a neoadjuvant setting to go into pathologic complete remission. It's well known that when uh, you, you get a, um, a uh, pathologic complete remission, that means that the tumor shrinks away and you can't see it under pathology after you give the therapy. If that happens, that, that um, unequivocally predicts long-term survival. And we can even think of a cure for HER2 breast cancer by the neoadjuvant, uh, personalized neoadjuvant therapy. But it doesn't cause... Um, we don't see PCR rate in, in some patients, and we have toxicity, so we might want to switch to, to other types of therapies. So we took advantage of the uh, iSpy trial created by Laura Esserman. My colleague, uh, Dr. Petricoin, works closely with Laura Esserman. They've developed this in the United States, this fantastic new kind of trial in which a variety of different drugs are tried for a short time in patients. If that drug is looking like it's showing an improvement for that breast cancer patient, then the next patients that come along are have randomized so they have a higher chance of getting the successful drugs. And they were studying the role of neratinib in whether it would, could cause pathologic complete uh, remission of, of uh, breast cancer in a neoadjuvant treatment setting. So we looked to see if we could look at, uh, see if the phosphoprotein signature following laser capture microdissection could predict whether the patients were gonna go into PCR. So we had 193 patients, 115 had uh, got uh, in, uh, in the control, and we had the neratinib, 115, and we had the concurrent control. So this is a uh, this is a total population. And what we found was that if we looked at the phosphorylation of key signaling events in the cascade of the HER2 EGFR signaling, 
we found uh, that specific phosphorylation sites down at the uh, cytoplasmic tail, which are known to be the targets of kinase inhibitors, those were very statistically significantly elevated and elevated in, combine, in combination for the PCR patients, the patients who were found to go into pathologic complete remission. And we found that if we combined the, um, the phosphorylation state of HER2 and EGFR um, together, because these different receptors dimerize and work together to send a signal that's driving the breast cancer, when we combined these simply these two phosphoprotein markers by LCM proteomic analysis, we found 95 probability of phase three success for that, for neuratinib. Very exciting. And this was uh, published by Dr. Wolf Kuhl and, and JCO Precision Oncology. Not just for HER2 positive, but even for triple negative breast cancers as well, as shown here. But this is not only true for neuratinib, this is true for TDM1, a different therapy it's not a kinase inhibitor. It acts outside the cell on the receptor at the receptor level, and we found very high, highly significant correlation of the phosphorylation of the EGFR receptor uh, downstream phosphorylation sites and the HER2 receptor. So uh, again, the combination of both of those was highly predictive of patient going into PCR. We could separate out the responders and non-responders uh, by that simple combination of those two phosphomarker events. And so we, we, the conclusion um, is that we can predict pathologic complete remission in the, in the biopsy, the diagnostic biopsy that the, that the patient has, let's say, after a biopsy from a suspicious mammogram, we can predict what's the best therapy for that patient and whether it's going to, they're going to go into pathologic complete remission. And so we envision a future and we're, we're studying the, the data that I showed you was blinded data. We didn't know the outcome blinded, but now we're going to do a separate blinded study that is funded by the um, uh, DOD breast cancer research program and it's between Rutgers cancer center and and our George Mason University Center, we're going to do a blinded analysis of whether we have uh, um, ad adequate prediction of PCR for all types of HER2 therapy. And if that works, we can then envision a future in which we take the patient's diagnostic biopsy at the time when they see that they have, they're HER2 positive and they are eligible for neoadjuvant anti-HER2 therapy. And we can say by looking at their tissue that they are have a high likelihood or a low likelihood of responding to different uh, HER2 therapies. Or you might they might require escalation, or uh, we might say that we're you know, not going to give it to them if it looks like they're not going to respond. Or we can maybe escalate the treatment or bring in new treatments. Because all of these therapies in the end work through at the at the downstream level, these same markers that we're looking at. So just looking at these two markers by laser capture microdissection in a patient's biopsy sample might give us a way to individualize therapy for breast cancer, HER2 positive breast cancer, or maybe even for um, triple negative breast cancer. And so we, visualize, we visualize further the development of laser capture microdissection or other technologies for sampling that we've been that we're hearing about uh, in the literature, or uh, attendees of this symposium might be developing. Um, but we see a future in which everything becomes digital, digital pathology, di digital molecular analysis of individual cells, and so the. Imagine the pathologist looking on the screen to see the complex tissue. This is marked with a, 
a mouse or with a, a just with a, a stylus. These are the areas the pathologist is interested in sampling. We have a visualization fluid that we can put on the tissue so that even if it's open face with no cover slip, you get beautiful color images for um, microdissection or for other types of uh, probing or scraping, any type of analysis that you want to use, or for MALDI mass spec or CYTOF. Once you identify the regions of interest, then they're sampled, uh, they're removed as shown here, and they're analyzed, but that's done remotely. And then the, an the answer, the molecular proteomic genomic transcriptomic glycomic analysis comes back to the same image for a patient report for that, that pathologist to read. So we can uh, see that this could be really exciting future for pathology. You see what you want to analyze and then it comes back to you on the screen and even that can be done remotely by the pathologist. And so that's where the field is going. We're very excited about that and as we sift through many, many discoveries and different biomarkers that we look at within tissue in the future, we may be just looking at a few of them that have the key, key information for making a decision about the patient. So thank you for your attention. Here's the, uh, our research group that's done all this great work and um, you know, look forward to answering any questions that you might have.